Okay, first graders, today let's see if we can read some more of the panda puzzle. So where we left off, Winnie the baby panda has been panda napped and the panda nappers are demanding a million dollars to get her back safely. And we have three main suspects, two of which they've already interviewed. So they already interviewed Irene Naper, who takes care of the pandas, and she's suspicious because she's the only one that has a key. And then they interviewed Tom Steele, who writes the paper, and he was suspicious for a lot of reasons. He had a cut on his hand, he had a fishing pole, and remember they found that fishing knife, and oh, he had cut up newspapers all over his desk. Very shady. And now they're on their way to interview Flip Francis, who was our third suspect. We're on chapter six. A sign outside the fitness center said, no pets, no bare feet, no smoking. Josh tied Pal to a tree, patted his head and said, stay boy. Pal sighed and flopped down. His big brown eyes watched Josh. Dink and Ruth Rose enter the building. The fitness center was one enormous room. One end was filled with exercise equipment. A bank of windows looked out on Wren Drive. A shimmery pool took up the other end of the room. A lifeguard watched three swimmers doing laps. Other people were using the weights and machines. The clang of metal hitting metal fought the rock music blaring from hidden speakers. Dink wrinkled his nose. He smelled a combination of sweat and chlorine. A green awning was stretched over the counter where juice and health foods were being sold. I need a milkshake, Josh said, shouting above the music. I feel weak. They sell health shakes, Ruth Rose informed him. They make them from seaweed and tofu. What's tofu? Ruth Rose giggled. It's white and wiggly, she said. You won't like it, Josh. There's Flip, Ding said, behind the counter. Flip Francis was wearing a t-shirt and blue shorts. He had long, muscular arms. Can I help you, kids? He asked. Hi, Mr. Francis, Dink said. I'm writing a story about pandas. <clears throat> Can we interview you? Call me Flip, the man said, smiling at Dink. Who are you? Call him Dink, Josh said, eyeing the shake machine. Flip noticed and asked, you guys thirsty? How about a shake on me? Sure, Josh said, but no tofu, please, or seaweed. Flip Francis laughed. How about milk, yogurt, and strawberries? Now you're talking, Josh said, hoisting himself onto a stool. Flip expertly tossed ingredients into a blender. He switched it on for a minute, then poured the frothy pink concoction into tall, three tall glasses. We were there this morning, Dink said. Flip slid the shakes and a jar of straws in front of the kids. My granny Wynne would be heartbroken if she knew, he said. The kids began drinking. Josh made loud slurping noises through his straw. Dink picked up his pencil. Why do they call you Flip? He asked. I work out a lot on the floor mats, Flip said. He grinned. I guess I'm famous for my backflips. Why do they call you Dink? Josh started to laugh and choked on his shake. My real name is Donald David Duncan, Dink told him. I guess Dink is easier. Flip looked at Dink's notebook. So, how much have you written? He asked. Not much, Dink said. We're talking to people who know Winnie. Did your grandmother like pandas? Ruth Rose asked. Is that why she left all that money? Flip nodded. Granny Wynne loved animals, he said. She used to donate money to animal shelters all the time. Dink glanced at his notes about Irene Naper. Do you know who has keys to the panda enclosure? He asked. Flip nodded. Yep, Irene has one. I don't know who else. Have you ever seen anybody strange hanging around Panda Park? Josh asked. Flip looked at the ceiling. Not strange, maybe, but that guy who writes the panda paper seems to be there a lot. Tom Steele. In his notebook, Dink wrote Tom Steele in dark letters. Anything else? Flip asked. It's almost my lunch break. The kids finished their shakes. Thanks a lot, Dink told Flip. Glad to do it, he answered. Just then, a tall, red-headed woman approached the counter. She was dressed like Flip in a t-shirt and blue shorts. Sorry I'm late, she said to Flip. You can take off for lunch now. No problem, Kate, he said. Late lunch is better than no lunch. Flip placed both hands on the counter and bolted over it. Good luck with your story, he said to the kids as he strode out the door. Dink, Josh, and Ruth Rose followed Flip out. They saw him leap into a dusty jeep with a rack on top. He honked the horn and waved as he pulled onto Bridge Lane. Well, what do you think? Dink asked, watching the jeep turn right on Main Street. He gets my vote, Josh said, untying Pal's leech, leash from a tree. That guy could climb an eight-foot fence with one arm tied behind his back. Ruth Rose laughed. Joshua, ten minutes ago you said the kidnapper was Tom Steele. Yeah, said Dink, and before that you were so sure it was Irene Naper. So who do you think it is? Josh asked. It could be any of them, Dink said with a sigh. He shoved his notebook into his back pocket. Did you guys notice that rack on Flip's Jeep? Ruth Rose asked. I wonder if that's for a boat. I don't get it, Josh said. Maybe Flip is a fisherman, Josh Ruth Rose said. Remember the knife? Wait a sec, Dink said. He zipped back inside the fitness center. Kate looked up and smiled at him. Come to work out? Kids get in free after three o'clock on Sundays. She slid three passes across the counter. Thanks, Dink said, slipping the passes into his pocket. Then he crossed his fingers behind his back. Flip said something about going fishing later. Do you know if he has a boat? 
Just an old canoe, she said, but he can't go fishing. He's working all day. Dink felt himself blush. Oh, um, maybe I made a mistake. See ya, he darted back outside. Canoe, he said. See? Josh crowed. That doesn't prove anything, Dink said. All three of the people we talked about could have done it. And time is running out for Winnie, Ruth Rose said. Eight hours till midnight. Josh looked at his watch. Yikes, he said, starting to run. I have to be home in five minutes. He's running home. So Flip has some strikes against him, too, because he's very athletic. He can flip over things, so climbing the fence would not be an issue. And he also has a boat, so maybe he could have a fishing knife, too. So it seems like every person has a little bit of evidence for them. I wonder who you guys think did it. Remember, any of these clues could be red herrings, right? Maybe they're just trying to throw us off the track. We'll have to see. Oh, chapter seven has a different picture. Chapter seven. The kids hurried to Josh's house. His parents were waiting. We'll be back in about an hour, Josh's mom told him as she climbed into the family car. Josh's dad waved and pulled out of the driveway. I want to ride the pony, Brian yelled, tugging at Josh's arm. No, I want to catch turtles in the river, Brian's twin brother Bradley bellowed, yanking the other arm. You can't do either one without mom and dad's permission, Josh said. Then we get candy, Brian said. No, we get ice cream, Bradley argued, bolting for the house. Josh sighed and followed his brothers. Dink and Ruth Rose laughed, trailing after Josh. Inside, Josh poured five glasses of orange juice. Brian jumped off his chair and ran from the room. He was back in a flash with a flat cardboard box. Let me help, Bradley said. No, it's my puzzle, Brian yelled. Josh, you guys do the puzzle together or not at all, Josh said. And don't get your sticky little fingers all over the pieces. What's the puzzle, Bradley? Ruth Rose asked. Grizzly bears, Bradley answered, dumping the pieces onto the table. The picture on the box showed a mama grizzly bear and her cub. The puzzle pieces were large, just right for four-year-old little fingers. Brian and Bradley had done this puzzle before. Their hands flew over the pieces, jamming them into place. A few minutes later, the puzzle was complete, except for one piece. The baby grizzly bear's face was missing. You took it, Brian yelled at Bradley. Did not, you did, Bradley yelled right back. Don't argue, guys, Josh said. He dropped down to the floor and looked under the table. Not here. Maybe it's in your room. The twins flew out of the kitchen and thundered toward their bedroom. Twenty seconds later, they charged back into the kitchen. Bradley held the missing piece in his little hand. He lurched back into his chair and fitted the piece into place. Where'd you find it? Josh asked. Under my bed, Bradley said, grinning. I wish finding the missing panda bear was that easy, Dink said. Ruth Rose sat up. That's it, she said. Maybe we should be looking for Winnie, not the person who took her. But where? Dink asked. He could have stuck her anywhere. If I kidnapped a panda bear, Ruth Rose said, where would I hide it? Josh took a bowl of apples out of the refrigerator and gave one to Brian and one to Bradley. You can feed the cores to the pony, he told them. The twins shot out the back door, racing each other to the barn. Pal waddled after them. Remember the pony? They just got that pony um, in the orange outlaw. Um, Dink, Josh, and Ruth Rose took their apples outside. They sat on the back steps and watched the twins pet Polly through the corral rails. Baby panda bears aren't housebroken like regular pets, Josh said, munching his apple. You couldn't really hide one in your house. And I bet Winnie misses her mom, Ruth Rose said. She'd probably cry a lot. People would hear her. Right, said Josh. So the kidnappers probably hid her where it's already noisy. Dink watched Polly the pony chomp Brian's apple core. The kidnapper has to feed Winnie, so he'd have to keep her nearby. I know a place, Ruth Rose said. It's noisy and smelly and not far from the petting zoo. Do you guys have a guess? Where have they been that's noisy and smelly? Josh grinned at Ruth Rose. I do too. The fitness center, right? Ruth Rose nodded. If Flip stole Winnie, that would be the perfect place to hide her. Should we go back and have a look? Dink asked. But what do we do about Flip? Josh asked. If he really is the kidnapper, won't he be suspicious when we show up again? Dink reached into his pocket and brought out the passes. Kids get in free today, he said. Excellent, Ruth Rose said. We can go for a swim and a snoop. We're going to go see if they can find Winnie. Chapter 8. The kids met in front of the fitness center an hour later. They were carrying their bathing suits and towels. Flip and Kate were behind the counter. The gym was crowded and the music was still blasting. Back again, Flip asked. Dink laid the three passes on the counter. We came for a swim, he said. Great idea, said Kate. Come on, I'll show you where to change. She led the kids toward the pool. There were a lot of other kids splashing around. A few grown-ups sat on the side, watching. The lifeguard prowled around the pool, keeping a sharp eye on the swimmers. Kate stopped in front of a row of four doors. Two of them were labeled men and women, but the two doors in the middle were unmarked. 
Here are the changing rooms, Kate said. No diving, no running, and listen for Danny's whistle. If he blows it once, everyone freeze. Then he'll blow it again, twice. That means kids get out of the pool for 15 minutes while the adults swim. Have a good time. See you in three minutes, Ruth Rowe said, and disappeared into the girls' changing room. Dink and Josh went into theirs and found themselves alone. Blue metal lockers lined the four walls. At the far end were showers, sinks, toilets, and a floor-to-ceiling mirror. The floor was carpeted, and there were benches to sit on. Dink walked over to a small closet with storage stenciled on the door. He peeked inside. See any pandas? Josh whispered. Dink glanced at Josh in the mirror. No, but I see a skinny red-headed monkey. You are so dunked when I get in that pool, Josh said. The boys changed, stashed their clothes in two lockers, and headed for the pool. The lifeguard stopped them. Hi, guys, he said. I'm sure Kate explained to you the rules, right? You've got about ten minutes before adults swim. Have fun. Thanks, we will, Dink said. Ruth Rose came out wearing a lime green bathing suit. The kids jumped into the water at the shallow end. Now what, Josh asked, glancing toward Flip behind the counter. I wonder what's behind those other doors, Dink asked. One might lead to the bowling alley, Josh said. I think it's right below us. Maybe we can check them out during adult swim, Ruth Rose said. When the whistle blows, make sure you climb out on that side. While they waited, the kids swam and splashed each other. Josh tried standing on his head underwater. He came up coughing. Suddenly, the whistle blew. Everyone in the pool turned and faced the lifeguard. Adult swim, he yelled, and blew the whistle twice more. There was a wet stampede as the kids claimed, climbed out of the water. At the same time, the adults tried to climb in the pool. Most of the confusion was right in front of the changing rooms. No one noticed as Ruth Rose tried the handles on the unmarked doors. One was locked, but the other one opened. Come on, Ruth Rose whispered as she slipped through. Dink and Josh were right behind her. When Dink pulled the door closed, it was pitch black. Where are we? Josh asked, shivering. All three kids were dripping pool water. Dink put his arms out and touched the smooth walls on each side. He inched one bare foot forward and felt the edge of a wooden step. I think we might be at the top of a staircase, he whispered. Let's try to find a light, Josh said. I don't like the dark. Not yet, Ruth Rose said. Let's feel our way down and see if there's a light at the bottom. Watch out for slivers, Dink said. The kids made their way down the stairs. They reached the hard, cold floor and stopped. Okay, I'm not going any farther without light, Josh announced. I feel like one of those blind fish that live in a cave. They felt around on the walls. Got it, Ruth Rose said. There was a click and the lights came on. The kids were standing at one end of a corridor. The floor was smooth as stone. The bottom half of the walls was rougher stone, with newer-looking painted boards on the top. The ceiling was a mess of ancient wooden beams, rusty pipes, and spider webs. Check this out, Dink said. He scratched into the mortar between two stones was the date 1902. This wall was built more than a hundred years ago. And it's still Creepsville, Josh said, through clattering teeth. These stones are c cold. The narrow corridor was filled with broken gym equipment, rolled up floor mats, and a large, large paint containers. A row of cardboard boxes lined the right-hand wall. There were no other doors in the corridor. What's that noise? Ruth Rose asked. It sounds like thunder. Dink leaned his head against the wall. I think the bowling alley is on the other side, he said. The kids began walking along the hallway. Let's look in every box, Ruth Rose said. Winnie's small, so she could be hidden anywhere. Five minutes later, they'd run out of boxes. Most had been empty, but a few held white packing peanuts. The kids stood at the end of the corridor and thought about what to do next. The floor mat had been left there. The kids flopped down on it. Josh rubbed his bare feet and shivered. It's weird that they have this long hall with no doors, Dink said. Maybe it was an old basement before the fitness center got built, Ruth Rose said. Ouch, Josh said. Now what, Dink asked. I don't know, but it hurts. Josh got up and poked the mat where he'd been sitting. Help me lift this thing, he said. There's something under it. The kids got up and helped Josh lift the mat. Hidden underneath was the metal handle of a trap door. Ooh, a trap door. A lot of trap doors in these books. Hope you can see it. Hmm, wonder what's in the trap door. Chapter nine. Should we open it? Josh asked. Without answering, Dink grabbed the handle and pulled. The door came up easily. Beneath it were stone stairs leading down. They heard something skittering about in the darkness below. Yuck, rats, Josh said. If you think I'm going... Shh, I heard something else, Ruth Rose said. Then they all heard it. It was a squeaking, crying noise. That's Winnie, Ruth Rose said. She ran down the stairs. Dink and Josh were right behind her. The air at the bottom of the steps was filled with some kind of dust. It stung their eyes. The only light came through the open trap door. Guys, they think we're in an old coal cellar, Josh said. My grandfather has one and it's just like this. 
Dink could feel the cold dust in his eyes and nose and on his lips. He began to cough. Look, there's Winnie, Ruth Rose whispered. Across the room glowed a pair of eyes. Suddenly, the trap door slammed shut. Instantly, they were in total darkness. Then they heard the sound of metal on metal. Someone's locking us in, Josh said. I can't see anything. Let's not panic, okay, Ruth Rose said. Let's just sit down where we are, Dink suggested. But I can't see, Josh complained. This place is disgusting. Dink sat down. Underneath him, he felt a few lumps of coal. He brushed them aside. I'll bet Flip locked us in, Ruth Rose said. He must have figured out where we went. Dink heard Josh standing up. What are you doing, Josh? This building is old, so maybe the lock is too, Josh said. I might be able to force it. First of all, they're always trapped someplace. They get trapped in a lot of basements. They got trapped in a boat that time. They are always trapped. Um, but also, if Winnie is hidden in the fitness center, I think that narrows down our suspects. What do you think? The kids seem to think it too. They think it's Flip Francis. I wonder if you're on board with Flip Francis now. Um, I'll help you, Dink said. He and Josh stumbled up the steps and moved against the trap door. It didn't budge. Well, it was a good idea, Josh, Dink said. They found their way back down the steps and next to Ruth Rose. How are we supposed to get out of here? Josh asked in a shaky voice. Maybe there's a window, Ruth Rose said. Don't basements have windows? But it's not a basement, Josh said. It's just an old room where they kept the coal in the old days. I bet no one ever comes down here anymore, Dink said. It was a good place to hide Winnie. Where is she, I wonder, Ruth Rose said. She's probably hiding, Dink said. If only we had a light. Gee, if I'd known I was going to be trapped underground, Josh said, I'd have brought my flashlight. Don't worry, Ruth Rose said. Flip will let us out after he collects his money at midnight. Well, I'm not sitting here till midnight, Josh said, standing up. I have a plan. You do, Dink said. Yeah, Josh said, sliding lumps of coal out of the way with his bare feet. Let's hold hands and try to find the walls. Then we can feel around the whole room. What are we feeling for? Ruth Rose asked. The coal chute, Josh said. The coal chute? Dink said, like in a gun? The coal chute, Dink. C-H-U-T-E, Josh said. My grandfather told me how coal used to be delivered. They slid it down a chute right into a basement. So sort of like a slide, like there'd be an opening on the outside where somebody could come and deliver coal and it would slide down into the coal room where they are now. So they're gonna see if they can find that hole. Um, so you're saying there's one of those slide things around here somewhere, Ruth Rose asked. Yeah, and it'll lead outside. The kids held hands while Ruth Rose, with Ruth Rose in the middle. Dink and Josh reached out and felt for the walls. Seconds later, Dink tripped over something. He landed on his hands and knees in a pile of coal. I found a shovel, Dink said, running a hand over the metal shape. He used the shovel to help himself stand. He lost his balance and fell against a wall. Okay, he said, rubbing his elbow. I found a wall. Now what? Feel along for some kind of opening, Josh said. It might be kind of high up. All three kids moved along the wall, feeling their way. Dink used the shovel like a cane and shuffled along. Once Dink heard a whimper. It's okay, Winnie, he said into the darkness. We're the good guys. Suddenly, Ruth Rose shouted, I found something. What's it feel like, Josh asked. Like a window frame, she said. But there's no glass. There's a piece of board or something where the glass should be. That must be the chute, Josh said. How high up is it? A little above my head, Ruth Rose said, but I can reach it. Dink and Josh felt their way along the wall until they were standing next to Ruth Rose. I think you found it, Ruth Rose, Josh said. But how will we get it open? Dink lifted the heavy metal shovel. Will this do? He asked. Well, at least they found a way that might lead out. Chapter 10. We're almost done. Two more chapters. Dink felt the wood that covered the chute. It feels old, he said. Back away, you guys. I'll smack it with the shovel. How will you hit anything? Ruth Rose asked. I can't even see you. Dink felt the chute again, judging its distance. He raised the shovel over his head, swung, and missed. Pretend you're blindfolded and you're swinging at a pinata, Josh said. It's filled with candy and money and cookies. Thwack. Dink's second swing struck something solid. Now that he had the right location, he was able to hit it every time. See if it's loose, Dink said out of breath. Wait a minute, Ruth Rose said. She stepped forward and felt for the wood. I think you cracked it. Okay, get back again, Dink said. He swung the shovel with all his might. This time, the wood shattered. You got it, Josh said, pulling broken wood away. Oh, gross, there's something slimy on me. As he spoke, a pile of wet stuff fell into the room. It smelled worse than the coal dust. A beam of sunlight fell through the chute. At Josh's feet was a pile of rotted leaves. You did it, Ding, Ruth Rose cried. Then she started to laugh. What, Josh asked. Our legs and feet are black. We look like pandas, she said. The kids stared up at the sunlight. The chute was slanted. It was easy to see how coal could come sliding down into the cellar. 
And there's the coal chute up above their heads. You can see the shovel they used, and Josh is holding the wood that they broke apart. They're good. I guess all that getting trapped comes in handy. They can know how to get out of stuff now. Um, we need something to climb on, Josh said. All, I, all we have is the coal, Ruth Rose said, and my handy-dandy coal shovel, Dink added. What if we make a pile right under the opening? But how do we climb out, Josh asked. The chute is steep and looks slippery. We can boost each other up, Josh said. The first one out can pull the next one. The ones on the inside can push. But how about the last person, Ruth Rose asked. Who boosts him up? And what about Winnie? I guess somebody has to stay here while the others get help, Dink said. The kids stood and thought, with the sunlight streaming down through the chute. How's this, Josh said after a minute. Ruth Rose, you're the smallest. What if Dink and I boost you through the chute? We can stay here with Winnie while you run to the police station. Are you sure? Ruth Rose asked. Maybe you should go. You're a faster runner. Nah, I have to stay and protect Dink, Josh said. He's afraid of the dark. Okay, let's get to work, Dink said. We'll take turns shoveling. Ten minutes later, Ruth Rose stood on a small mountain of coal. She stuck her arms in the chute, then her head and shoulders. Okay, push, you guys. Dink and Josh pushed Ruth Rose until only the bottoms of her feet were sticking out of the chute. More, she said, her voice sounding hollow. I can't reach the other end. As the boys pushed the bottoms of her feet, Ruth Rose inched farther up the chute. Okay, came her faraway voice. Dink could hear her scrambling to pull herself out. When he and Josh looked up the chute, they saw her face on the other end. Try to find Winnie, she said. Then she was gone. Dink and Josh sat on the coal they'd piled up. Neither wanted to leave the comforting shaft of sunlight. How do we find a black and white panda who's now all black? Josh asked. Maybe if we're real quiet, we'll hear her, Dink said. They sat totally still on their hill of coal. The sunlight fell between them, bouncing off in shiny black chunks. Dink heard his own breathing and Josh's, but try as he might, he couldn't hear anything else. Then Josh giggled. What's funny? Dink asked, glancing over at Josh. A coal black baby panda had crawled into Josh's lap. It was snuggling against him. Winnie must think you're her mama, Dink said. Boy, do I wish I had Ruth Rose's camcorder now. Dink and Josh sat cuddled with Winnie. The sunlight coming through the chute warmed them. Dink heard something over his head. Listen, he whispered. Sounds like someone walking, Josh said, holding Winnie tighter. Suddenly, they heard the trap door opening and more light fell into the room. Dink? Josh? It was Ruth Rose's voice. I brought Officer Fallon. And here is the cutest picture. I hope you can see it okay. There's Dink and Josh and they're holding baby Winnie. She's so cute. I like her. Last chapter. Chapter 11. If it hadn't been for you kids, Flip would have gotten away with it, Officer Fallon said later that evening. Dink, Josh, and Ruth Rose were sitting on the lawn at Panda Park. Inside the fence, Ping and Winnie were playing tug-of-war with a stalk of bamboo. Winnie's fur was once again black and white. Dink, Josh, and Ruth Rose were clean, too. A few hours later, they had surprised their families by showing up completely covered with coal dust. He'd have picked up the money at midnight and let you kids, and then let you kids out of the coal cellar, Officer Fallon continued. So no one would have proved, could have proved that he took Winnie or locked us in, right? Dink asked. Officer Fallon nodded. That's right, he said. No one saw him take Winnie or lock that trap door. He'd have hidden the money somewhere. In a year or so, he might have begun spending it. Were you really going to leave a million bucks in that hollow tree? Asked Josh. Officer Fallon nodded. Flip knew we had no choice, he said. Just then, Ping yawned, rolled over on her back, and went to sleep. Winnie cuddled next to her and chewed the bamboo stalk. Too bad Win Francis isn't here to see this, Dink said. Did she leave Flip any money? Ruth Rose asked. Some, Officer Fallon said, but I guess Flip thought he was entitled to all of it. Did he confess? Josh asked. Officer Fallon nodded. You should have seen his face when I walked into the gym with Ruth Rose. He thought I was still in the coal cellar, Ruth Rose said. I guess I must have looked like a ghost. What will happen to him? Dink asked. He'll probably go to jail for attempting to extort money, Officer Fallon said. Plus, he stole Winnie and trapped you kids in a coal cellar. Everyone was quiet for a moment. Sometimes a judge will give a young person a second chance, Officer Fallon went on, especially if it's his first crime. Flip seems very sorry for what he did. The judge might ask him to do community service in place of some of the jail time. What's community service? Dink asked. That means that Flip would do work for Greenlawn as part of his sentence. What kind of work? Josh asked. Officer Fi Fallon smiled. Got any good ideas? I do, Dink said. He could give free gymnastic, gymnastic lessons to kids. And he could help out at the senior center, Josh said. He could do exercises with the older people. I'm sure Flip would be willing and he'd be good at it, Officer Fallon said. And his grandmother would be proud of him, right? Ruth Rose asked. I knew Win Francis for many years, Officer Fallon said. She'd be sad about what Flip tried to do, but she was a woman who always gave people the benefit of the doubt. Win would give her grandson a second chance, too. 
So is this what they mean by a win-win situation? Josh asked. Exactly, Officer Fallon said. Now how about I treat us to ice cream cones at Ellie's? That's a Josh Josh situation, Dink said, smiling at his friends. One last picture. I'll show you one page first. So first there's little Winnie. And she's finally back with her mother. And then on this side are the kids talking to Officer Fallon. That's a good one. So it was Flip Francis. I wonder if some of you guessed that. They were making Tom Steele look pretty guilty for a while, but it turns out it was Flip. I bet some of you figured that out. You guys are good. I wonder which book you like better now, The Orange Outlaw or The Panda Puzzle? Mm, I wish we could vote. I hope I get to find out soon. Maybe we'll read the next one soon. Bye.